This is Film Talk, where we interview the brightest minds in filmmaking five days a week. Do you need a great camera for your next shoot? You may want to consider the world's lightest handheld Super 35 digital film camera, Blackmagic's Ursa Mini 4.6K. The Ursa Mini boasts a 4.6K sensor, global shutter, and up to 15 stops of dynamic range. It's perfectly balanced for handheld use and comfortable enough to be used all day long. Scene one, take one. Film Talk Nation, we are greenlit for yet another great show. Vanessa Frank here, and I'm excited to bring you our featured guest today, Pam Wallace. Pam, are you ready for your close-up? Yes, I am. Pam Wallace is the Oscar-winning writer of Witness, an iconic movie which also won one other Oscar and was nominated in a further six categories. The movie additionally received six Golden Globe nominations, won a BAFTA award, and received a further six BAFTA nominations. She is also the writer of over 19 other movies, including If These Walls Could Talk, Love's Unending Legacy, and Class. And she is the author of 25 romance novels and the screenwriting book You Can Write a Movie. Pam, it's an honor to have you on the show today. Well, thank you very much. So, Pamela, I was incredibly excited to hear that you'd be joining us today as a question that I repeatedly like to ask all of my guests is, if there was one movie that you could recommend that people watch out of all of the, the entire history of film, what would it be? And one movie that comes up again and again and again, is Witness. Um, in fact, I was recently interviewing uh, DP Bob Scott, who is a veteran DP. He's had a number one box office hit. And I was asking him about the toughest moment that he's had in his career. And he was telling me about how he really was on the verge of quitting his career early on in his, his days as a DP. And he had an absolute paradigm shift when he went to see Witness in the theater and he had that quintessential moment when he realized that without a shadow of doubt, this is what he wanted to consecrate his life to. So I know that for many of us, Witness has been really a, a seminal film. And um, I'm just really particularly excited to hear what you're going to share today. Oh, well, that's an awfully kind compliment. Thank you for passing that along. So, Pam, how did you first get into the industry? You know, um, I started out as a novelist, and I was married to a screenwriter, and um, I came up with the idea for Witness, and my publisher turned it down. They didn't think it would make a good book, but my husband at that time thought it would be a great movie, and so we decided to, to do it together as a movie, and that was... Um, it was the first movie that I'd ever done. I had done an episode of a TV series before that, but when I did that episode, um, a, a friend was the producer on the show and um, kind of did me a favor, you know, giving me an opportunity to write an episode. And I was still, uh, even though I enjoyed it, I was still very much a novelist at that time, and it didn't occur to me that I should pursue screenwriting instead, but when we did Witness and it was so successful, that was when I decided that I really wanted to focus on, on doing movies rather than books after that. So what does that feel like to have your first ever movie go on to be nominated for six Oscars and win a further two Oscars? And I mean, you were, the the movie was nominated for some really the the heftiest categories um, in terms of Oscar nominations. I mean, you know, best best movie, best screenplay. D does that just feel completely overwhelming as your first experience of ever making a movie? It is overwhelming, that's for sure. And it is a shock and a surprise. And it's not something you can ever count on. Uh, I remember when Witness first, um, when the script sold, but it hadn't come out yet. And a friend asked me if I thought it was going to be a successful movie. And I said, no, it's going to be a nice little movie. That was how I described it, oh, a gosh. nice little movie. Yeah. 
So I, and, and it wasn't like anybody else expected it to do well. The studio didn't, you know, nobody saw it as, oh, this is going to be a hugely successful film. I think that it's almost impossible to ever predict the success of a movie, unless maybe it's, you know, the new Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was, you know, pretty clear that was going to be yeah. a big hit. But um, to me, it just, it reinforced the idea that William Goldman always said, which is nobody knows anything. Exactly. Exactly. I, I have to say, I've, I've heard a lot of things interviewing people, but that is a very clear denominator that is said in just about every single interview that I have with someone is nobody knows anything. And if there was one formula and someone had it, they would be a very rich man or woman. If there was a formula, every movie I wrote since Witness would have won an Oscar yeah. and been a huge success. But there, there, is, there isn't. There, there are formulas, but there isn't a formula for a big success. And the one true thing I took away from the experience with was that at the heart of the story was something that I cared passionately about. Mm -hmm. And that touched the audience. Mm -hmm. And because it touched the audience, it was successful. Yeah. And um, if you do a project, if there isn't something at the heart of it that you that you really feel pro profoundly, it's probably not going to be successful. Yeah. Is that a deal breaker for you now when people come to you with projects or you're looking at developing things? I would imagine that in the wake of Witness, you probably had innumerable offers. Is Is that a deal breaker or do you have that mentality of, it, that's something that can be found in every project if you just search deep enough. You know, I I think it's important for people to understand the struggle that I went through because it's what almost everybody will go through when they're pursuing uh, screenwriting as a career. At the time, witness happened because I was I was married to a screenwriter. Um, there was a general feeling that he probably was the one who wrote the movie. And that I probably didn't have much to do with yeah. it. Um, and I understood that attitude because it was my first, you know, film. Um, and it there there was a huge problem for me in pursuing a career after that. We actually got a divorce at the time the witness came out. Wow. So even though I you know, I, I had a writing credit on a movie that was so successful, I was now on my own yeah. as a writer. Yeah. And everybody wondered, well, can you really write? Or was it, you know, your husband yeah. who was the real writer? And it took me a few years to be able to establish uh, a career. Well, so that takes us in an interesting direction of something that is very much at the forefront of industry conversation right now, which is the whole perception of women as filmmakers, be they directors, producers, writers, and the absolutely woeful track record that Hollywood has for gender yeah. equality. Do you feel evidently now we're blessed in 2016 that this has become something that thanks to the New York Times and, and, and many other publications has become a scintillating issues that studio heads cannot avoid. Do you feel, though, that in, what was this, 1982? Am I right in thinking? 1986. Oh, 1986. Sorry, I was a little bit off. 1986. Do you feel that, that that gender bias was a component in what you struggled with? Oh, absolutely. It was a huge, a huge problem. It is, to this day, a huge problem. The Writers Guild does surveys every couple of years of employment practices, and they study how many women are employed, how many minorities, and those figures not only are not getting better, they're getting worse. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a serious issue, and I think it's something that absolutely needs to be remedied. I would contend it's uh, even questionably possibly illegal, um, some of what's going on, and I'm definitely one of those people who is 
heavily in support of some of the uh, legal, um, let's say, governmental review that is that has gone on. Because yeah. in in any other industry, if you had a situation where the uh, um, the the people getting work were ninety eight percent male. That would treat that would be unthinkable in almost any other industry, and there's no reason why um, it, that should be true of entertainment, particularly as art is by definition an expression of humanity. And as women, we represent 50% of that human experience, and arguably are oftentimes uh, even more talented naturally than men at emoting. Um, <laughs> so. Oh, I I couldn't agree more with you. I feel very passionate about this issue. And especially having personally experienced it, I know how horrific it is. Um, a few years ago, the uh, the academy, which I belong to, did um, a special. They did a special photograph of women who had won Oscars, and there were like a hundred. Wow! Of it. There was only one other woman there who had won for writing. Wow! Now. I don't believe, and we're talking about, you know, the every woman they could find who was still alive uh, and healthy enough, you know, to go and be part of, of this photograph. So we're talking about women over the last 30, 40 years. Yeah. And aside from me, one other woman, it was appalling mm. to me. Yeah. Are there any... Um... Are there any activities or groups that you are part of that that are making a difference in this area, or are you someone where it's more so a question of just your personal advocacy? You know, I, to be blunt, I'm quite cynical about it. Um, I don't see any progress being made. I love it when uh, high-profile people like Jennifer Lawrence comment on this issue. But there is a harsh reality, which is that Hollywood is an uh, an old boys network. It is run by men. It um, it will continue to be this way for quite some time. I don't know that it will ever really change or get better. Where I see reason for optimism is not in the mainstream filmmaking or TV industries. But in the new emerging areas of, you know, on the Internet, web series, that kind of thing, um, possibly in the independent film arena, um, you're just not going to get mainstream Hollywood to get to where it needs to be in terms of not just recognizing women, but recognizing anybody who's not a white male. I definitely feel that even for actresses, the prevalence of strong female protagonists is so much more notice noticeably so in some of these fantastic television um, network series that we're seeing come through, or just you know some of these kind of online hybrid platform series that we're we're seeing come through. And it seems to me that it does kind of emanate from this this drive of just incredible talent, talented people who are saying, okay, if, if mainstream Hollywood doesn't want to generate that excellent material for women where I'm going to be playing more than just the spouse or the girlfriend or, you know, the chick who's having a conversation about the protagonist, then I'm going to go to the arm candy. Format. Yes, the arm candy. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So has that been something that you've been more so um, going in the direction of like, Long form well, television I actually, and um, yes, absolutely. I uh, developed a potential web series that I'm in the process of trying to sell, and it's it's very female centric um, and and female oriented. Although I'm quite confident it would uh, appeal to the male audience as well as the the female. Um, so I'm I'm in the process of pursuing that now. But just today, I was watching. The Today Show on TV, and they had these women, I think there were five, and they were stand-up comics who did a web show and just sold it to TV Land yeah. as a series. And they play five women who are school teachers in the public school system, and it's it's a comedy. 
And this is a great example of women who got together and said, we're not going to wait for somebody to give us an opportunity. We're going to do everything we can to go out there and create an opportunity for ourselves. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, so just to slightly steer this in a, a different co- uh, a different direction, as I would be remiss to let um, – to to let this conversation go without asking you the one question that's personally just burning in my soul to ask you um as someone who for whom the love scene and witness for me is just the the ultimate in in my book it's the ultimate love scene um having seen many uh, rather more chase love scenes in my time i think it is just so poignant and symbolic and passionate and everything that a great love scene should be and it was incredibly epitomized by um harrison ford and um and uh kelly mcgillis do you i'm really interested to know being that you've you've also written all of these romance novels so you're clearly someone who has an incredible grasp on romance and what really sells to the audience what for you is the essence of capturing romance in a film you know i'm so glad you asked that question because it's something i i feel very strongly about um romance the the antithesis of romance is nudity yes and i don't say that as as a prude by any means um, but when people, whether it's men or women, but especially men, when they think about a romantic scene, they tend to think about, let's get the woman undressed. And that actually turns off the audience. Mm-hmm. There, it, There's no more magic. There's no more imagination. There's nothing held back than um, what an audience responds to in romance is anticipation, imagination. Imagination, emotion. Um, the what you want is for the audience to be watching these two people throughout the film, going, "Oh God, I can't wait for them to get together. When are they going to get together?" And you keep withholding. Yeah. And you withhold as long as possible, and you have yearning, and you have desire, but you don't just toss that off. Um, you hold off on it as long as possible. And a kiss is so much more powerful than an actual sex scene. And especially the way Hollywood does it, where, um, oh, way too often, you'll have the actress totally naked, even full frontal nudity, and the guy is dressed. Yes. And, you know, first of all, that's just not how people have sex, <laughs> mostly. Yeah. Um, but also that it's so sexist. Oh, don't even get me started on just the incredible double standard of it is so routine these days for us to see full frontal female nudity. And yet yeah. if the same is seen with a, a guy. It is headline grabbing. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm not saying that I particularly want to see either, but I do feel that there's a basis to say either we don't do this at all, or we need to see equality because what are, what are the messages that we're conveying to the audience? Really? What does that double standard in terms of exposure convey to young, to young minds? And I, the message to women is clear. You value lies in your body and to better be perfect. And men don't have to be perfect, and their value doesn't lie in their bodies. Absolutely. And it's a horrible message for women's self-esteem. Absolutely. Absolutely. Have you seen the film um, A Room with a View? Yes. It really, I loved A Room with a View for many of the reasons that I love Witnessed. Um, I just felt that that burgeoning sense of anticipation and uh, the premise of being in an era where people had, uh, you know, some greater standards in terms of patience and, as you so rightly said, yearning, um, I, I just found really beautiful. And there's that 
incredible scene right at the end of the movie where you've kind of been watching this this movie for like a couple of hours that's very restrained and closeted and Victorian yeah. and then right in like the last few frames of this movie is this just combustion of passion in this incredible kissing scene that is so much more powerful than countless other um, far more gratuitous just sex scenes I've seen. Did did that scene kind of make you think of a little bit of your work in Witness as well? You know, um, what, and I agree with you. I love that movie. I love that scene. I think that they handled it brilliantly. Um, the thing about the sex scene in Witness that kind of surprised me was in the original script, um, we didn't show having sex, and it was very yeah. much um, up in the air as to what the director would do with mm. it. You know, it was up to the director how much did he want to show. Yeah. Um, my feeling very strongly was these two people kissed, but they did not have yes. sex. Um, but coming out of the theater after watching it with an audience, I heard some people say, well, of course they made love. And yes. other people say, no, they didn't. And I thought, what a wonderful compliment that is that, could interpret it yes. as they saw it and how they wanted it to be, but it was open to interpretation. It's interesting. I just yesterday was watching Concussion uh, with Will Smith, which is um, a movie I personally really enjoyed and, and found very powerful and beautiful. And there was definitely that same dynamic that I was reflecting of, of uh, these are two people that we know at some point down the line get married but because the movie is in my opinion very tightly structured there's no room for extraneous scenes you don't kind of cut to the scene where they're getting married or the wedding night it's just implicit that at some point in this journey they've gotten married and at first the ambiguity of that kind of vexed me because the both characters are uh, very strictly Catholic and so having that slight ambiguity there was um, at first a little frustrating to me but then actually get on reflection I thought no it's it's actually really beautiful because it it again it just it brings that level of personal interpretation to the story which I think in a, in an era where so much is spoon fed to us that has some real intrinsic value. Well also I, I honestly cannot think of any um, really graphic sex scene in any movie that I have ever seen that I thought, oh, wow, that's a hot scene. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard to show two people having sex in a way that doesn't look a little bit awkward and yeah. silly and, you know, it's, it's not hot. Yeah, I heard a really interesting, uh, read a really interesting article about this, which I think was either by Ted Elliott or Terry Rossio. I, I feel like I'm attributing it to the right people, but it might have been a, a different writer. He was saying that, to, to put it very crudely, in terms of character exposition, when you actually think about the act of sex, there's very little character exposition kind of uh you know development that we can derive from that actual act of sex most of what we understand yeah. from a character is actually in the build-up to that the seduction the you know arguably the foreplay that's where you see the character development that's where you see their preferences that's where we understand a whole lot more about the character but not to want to be too crude when someone's you know going through the act of penetration I mean that's just not it's it's such a animal type moment that there's not a whole lot to learn about the character. And so looking at it purely from a, a filmic point of view, it's just not the most interesting moment of the story to tell. Well, even a movie like When Harry Met Sally, which is a comedy, the sex scene in there, you know, you don't see a sex scene, but you see them afterwards. I love that scene. And <laughs> for a minute, there's no dialogue. It's just see her expression. She's so happy. And you see his expression, he's terrified. Yeah. Oh my God, what have I just done? <laughs> and that is, that's character development. Yeah. That's story progression. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Pam, for you, 
what is the most critical factor that writers need to get right in a screenplay? If there's kind of one thing that you would say, this is the thing that is the most important to get right, what would that be? It would be what you are saying at the heart of the movie. The very heart of the movie, the, you can call it the central concept, the central idea. There's all kinds of terms for it. But what it boils down to, what is it that touched your heart and that is going to touch the heart of the audience? What is it that you are saying in this film, whether it's comedy, drama, whatever? Because if you don't have something that you feel deeply that you're expressing, then you're not going to reach the audience. And no matter how clever the dialogue or how great the actors are, or how great the director is, there's going to be that missing element that the audience could connect. Because the English novelist Ian Forster said, only connect. Film is all about connecting the writer to the audience. I feel like that's an issue that I see a lot with um, some of the movies I get to see where it's very much about the external plot and there's maybe this incredible mythology involved in the external plot, but that inner story is just completely lacking. It's like there's just not been any education with uh, the writer to help them understand it's that you have to start from the inside and work out rather than the opposite way around. And and the personal is universal. The yeah. more one of the most important lessons I learned was that the more deeply personal my feelings were about a story, the more universal yes. those feelings would be with an audience. Yes, absolutely. There's a um, something that I was taught early in my career. I used to work with, um, actually with Ian Canning, who is one of the Oscar-winning producers of The Queen's Speech. And he said something once in a meeting that has stuck with me and that I have quoted to many, many people since then, which is that a great movie has a universal story, but a local zip code. And I feel like that absolutely, um, yeah, doesn't that just express the heart of what a movie should be? It should have a universal story, but an individual's, uh, you know, a, a local zip yeah. code. So um, I'm just, this well, is. And the King's speech is a perfect example of that because, you know, it was about a king and his struggles. Well, not very many of us are kings, so you would think we can't relate to that, but It was the underdog, the one, you know, the person never felt good enough, always told they weren't good enough, and they have to rise to the occasion. Yeah. And it doesn't matter whether you're a king or a commoner then. Yeah, we can all relate to that. Um, Well, something I want to ask you that's a little bit off topic um, to do with films, but I'm just out of my own curiosity. I don't know if you're very familiar with um, faith-based literature, but I think find that I cannot, not that it happens very often that I walk into a Christian bookstore, but when I do, I find myself besieged with Amish romance novelization. <laughs> Is that something that's just wild to you looking back now when you first I presented? It. Yeah, you first presented this <laughs> idea for Witness and you're being told, oh, this movie, this Amish romance will never fly. And now if Christian, ro- if you're a Christian romance writer, you can't get anything else published than Amish fictionalization. I, you know, it, it's so weird, just flat weird to me that of all the things that, that would happen, there would be an explosion of, of uh, Amish faith-based <laughs> romance stories. Yeah. I honestly, I, I don't get it. The only thing I can say is I think it probably harkens to a desire on the part of people for a more innocent yes. and meaningful expression of love and sexuality. I completely agree. I I think it's that escapism that we live in a world of where most of us have have probably at this point seen most of the intimate parts of the Kardashians and Miley Cyrus and countless others. And and definitely, I think that there's for, for many of us, there's this desire to 
be a part of a world that's a lot simpler, a lot more chaste, where, you know, the really the, the, the world that many of us grew up in that was a lot, a lot simpler and a lot more innocent. Um, and it does, it does make me wonder to what extent Witness was maybe at the genesis of this whole trend of Amish romance fiction. Well, I know that that, that genre did not exist before Witness. And it was actually quite some time after Witness that it, it started to become popular. Um, I'm just amazed that it became as popular as it did and that it still remains. Yeah. You know, Does, are, your, are, are your romance books in that genre or do you write? Well, in I, I, haven't written, I haven't written books since, oh gosh, 20, 20 years. Oh, more. wow. Um, wow. Probably 25 years. Are you ever are you ever tempted to exploit this massive trend? Because I mean, I would imagine you could walk into just about any one of these publishers and say, <laughs> "I'm the right of witness," and they would kind of roll out the red carpet for you. No, I I have no desire to yeah. to do that at all. You know, I I really feel like been there, done that. I was going to say, I think once you've once you've written Witness, it's like you've you've kind of I mean that's like the summit of what one could artistically reach in in that in that genre in that world. Genre. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pam, we're about to enter our final act in which we're going to be getting some of your top recommendations. But before we do so, let's take a moment to thank our sponsors. When you're putting together that masterpiece movie, the coloring is a major creative decision. It can make the difference between whether the audience interprets your story as warm, cold, dark, or light, and it can help define the genre of the film. Here's a quick tip. Horror movies tend to have blue tones. Romantic comedies tend to have warm tones. Apocalyptic movies tend to be gray and washed out. Movies in which reality is off kilter tend to have green tones. And action movies tend to feature a lot of teal and orange, particularly in their artwork. The Emmy Award winning Da Vinci Resolve from Black Magic will help you get that perfect color for your next production. The Da Vinci Resolve 12 combines professional non-linear video editing with the world's most advanced color corrector. So you can now edit, color correct, finish and deliver all from one system. The DaVinci Resolve is completely scalable and resolution independent, so it can be used on set, in a small studio, or integrated into the largest Hollywood production pipeline. From creative editing and multi-camera television production to high-end finishing and color correction, only DaVinci Resolve features the creative tools, compatibility, speed, and legendary image quality that you need to manage your entire workflow, which is why it is the number one solution used on Hollywood feature films. Pam, welcome to the final act where you'll be sharing incredible resources and mind-blowing answers. Are you ready? I'm ready. Pam, what is the best advice you've ever received? You know, I, I wish I, I could I could repeat all the advice I ever received because I've, I've gotten so much good advice and there's so much that new and experienced writers need to know. I feel like I wish I could just, you know, tell it all. But if I had to boil it down to one thing, it would be to, to focus on that part of the story that we talked about, the thing that you relate to that, that touches you, that touches the audience. If, you're, if you don't have that, if you say, oh, well, zombie movies are selling, so I'm going to write a zombie movie, you're probably not going to succeed. But if you say, I have this particular feeling about something that happens to fall into the zombie genre, and this feeling I have about it is special and deep, it's really, it, it comes down to emotion. And, and how you feel deep in your heart about a story, it doesn't do any good to, um, to be, how do I put this, to go from the outside in to say, okay, a particular genre is popular, so I'll write that genre. That doesn't work. What works is, oh, I have this strong feeling about something that happens to be in the action genre or horror genre, romance, um, and so I'm going to express this deep feeling I have in that genre. 
Now, having said that, you do have to be pragmatic. When I came up for the the concept of, of witness, it was based on a very deep emotional response I had to something that happened to uh, some Amish people. But I knew that if I tried to do a movie that was just a, you know a study of the Amish, that nobody would buy it. I knew I had to find a commercial way of structuring the story, a way that would stand a chance of selling as a movie. And I felt that the kind of action slash romance genre would be a perfect way to express these feelings that I had about the Amish. So you have to be pragmatic about it and understand how our, the business side of our business works. But at the heart of it, at the heart of the story, it still has to be about emotion. That's great advice, Pam. Um, if you had just the one movie to stake your entire career on, what kind of movie would it be and what talent would you want attached? Um, I have not yet done the movie that I feel like, well, that justifies my career because I want to do a movie that really has an impact on people that really even more so than witness. Cause I mean, I feel like, you know, when so many people within the industry would, would count that as being the one movie that they would recommend people watch. I mean, that's a pretty huge legacy already. Well, it's a, it is an honor. Definitely. I'm, I'm, it, it's a legacy that I, I carry with tremendous honor and, and gratitude. But, for instance, I'm working on a project right now, and it's about childhood sexual abuse. And if this movie gets made, it will impact people. It will change lives. It will help people. That, to me, is the ultimate that I personally, as a writer, aspire to. Yeah. So that component of changing lives at a very very fundamental level um, is something that's particularly important to you as as an individual? Well, film is probably the single most powerful um, communication uh, method. And it has, film has the ability to affect our world Mm. for good or bad. ISIS is partly succeeding because they've gotten damn good you know, video and communication and all of that. Mm. So, um, you know, that tells you what a powerful medium this is for for good or bad. And um, it's wonderful to have a successful career and do movies you're proud of, but the ultimate fulfillment would do something where you can say that changed people's lives. I was just chatting recently with Gareth Unwin, who is uh, one of the producers of The King's Speech, and he was saying to me precisely that, that he's The King's Speech won four Oscars, and then he went on and did this movie called Kajaki that um, has had less of an illustrious run in terms of awards. It's still done very well for itself, but he was really saying that for him he really tries to put an equal value on the fact that he knows that that movie um, has been a a real vehicle of healing for a lot of soldiers that return from war with PTSD and a lot of shock around what they've gone through. And he was saying, really, how can you measure if a movie like this was a huge vehicle of healing for maybe the the three soldiers that it portrayed is that really more valuable or less valuable than winning all of these oscars and he was saying that's really you, you kind of have to have a way of measuring things that holds both of these sides of the equation equally yes oh i couldn't agree more so pam you've obviously written a huge number of books. If you could recommend a book for our listeners of the books that you've personally read that you've maybe found helpful in your career, what would it be and why? Well, I've read, I have read a ton of, of books on screenwriting and learned from every single one of them. 
Um, I can't honestly say, well, there, there's one particular book I would recommend because there are just so many that are so good. But what I would recommend instead of a particular screenwriting book is to study psychology. Because the more you understand human psychology, the better your stories are going to be. Absolutely. I deeply agree. I believe that it's an essential part of every writer's toolkit to be a part-time psychologist, so to speak. I mean, it's if you want to oh, yeah. write if you want to write stories from the inside out, you have to first understand what's on that inside. What is that motivating factor? What is that conflict that's going to be itching away at this character throughout the throughout the plot? Absolutely. Well, Film Talk Nation, I know that you love Audio. To thank you for joining us today, we've partnered with our friends over at Audible to offer you a free audio book. Great titles available include Story by Robert McKee, Save the Cat Strikes Back by Blake Snyder, Why Not Me by Mindy Kaling, and Your Year of Yes by Shonda Rhimes. If you haven't already done so, you can claim your free audio book at audibletrial.com forward slash film talk. That's audibletrial.com forward slash film talk. And this link will also be included in today's show notes. Pam, if you could recommend, I'm actually going to ask you the question that many people normally answer this with witness, but if you could recommend one movie for our listeners, what would it be and why? Field of Dreams. Really? Because, yeah. I was not anticipating that. You know, it's funny because I don't like sports yeah. and I don't generally like sports movies, but Field of Dreams to me is the iconic film because it combines myth and meaning and emotion and it's so incredibly powerful um i think it, anybody can watch that movie learn from it because to me it is literally a perfect film it, it's interesting that you would say that because I feel like it's a pretty romantic movie, not in necessarily the literal sense, but in the sense of just that there's that sentimentality, there's that kind of desire for a time past. There is, there is, I feel there's quite a bit of that kind of like yearning that you were discussing. Yeah. So I feel actually now that I think about it, it actually, I can see completely how that fits with you and the the writer you are the style that you have um pam do you have maybe a website or an app that you find is really useful for you as a writer that you would recommend to our listeners i don't actually um i, I don't go to websites or or use apps very much at all however you mentioned ted elliott and terry rossio i think mm -hmm. are their names Yes. And they have some stuff on, on the web that I don't know if they're still doing it or not. It's still it's still while, up there. It's still up there. I was checking a couple of days ago. Are you um talking about wordplayer.com? Yes. Yeah. It's fabulous. It's like the most amazing treasure trove of information from two of the smartest guys um in Hollywood, I would contend <laughs> in terms of screenwriting. Um for those of our listeners who are not familiar, um, these are the writers of uh, several of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Um, they are incredibly talented at uh, large-scale franchise movies, um, and they have created this website that is an absolute, yeah, an absolute treasure trove of free information on every single facet imaginable of being a screenwriter be it the uh technique of screenwriting or be it the uh more mercurial tasks of taking meetings and pitching and and all of that kind of uh, more business oriented side of things and um i know for me it, it was one of the key resources that i dug into when i was learning to screenwrite and i think that even seasoned writers will find some nuggets of wisdom in there that they have not heard before. Oh, I, de I definitely did. 
Well, that's high commendation indeed. Uh, Oscar, Oscar winning writer, Pam Wallace. <laughs> it's, that's, that's humbling to those of us who haven't quite attained those heights yet. Um, well, Pam, it's time for the martini shot. What parting piece of guidance do you want to share with us? I think the single most useful thing a writer who's trying to learn how to be a screenwriter can do is probably study the Pixar movies. Yes. Because Pixar has story down. They, they revere story. They know how important it is. They honor it. And there's a reason why every single one of their movies is both a critical and commercial success. And it always is about what are they saying in the movie? What is at the heart of the movie? And if you read about how they go about developing their movies and and analyze their movies, you'll learn everything you know about screenwriting. I completely agree. I was watching the other day Inside Out, um, bizarrely enough, mostly on mute. And it was just amazing to me to see the extent to which that story completely holds up without dialogue, which I realized for many writers, myself included, who love the beauty of well-written dialogue, that could be kind of disheartening. But it just made me realize, wow, that the structure of this movie and the direction of this movie is so on point that dialogue is just an extra layer it's just the finishing the icing on the cake and yes. yeah and it's it, it just absolutely blew me away and I felt like watching that movie if I had to teach a class on screenwriting or filmmaking that for me that would probably be the movie that I would pull out as just a absolutely near flawless if not flawless example of incredible story structure yes well, Pam, thank you so much for your time. That is a wrap. Film Talk Nation, in this industry, you're only as good as the people you know. And today you've been hanging out with Pam Wallace and myself. If you want to go the extra mile, head over to filmtalkpodcast.com and type Pam Wallace into the search bar. The show notes from today's show will appear along with everything we discussed, like Pam's recommended book and movie. Pam, we appreciate you sharing your priceless insight with us today. Film Talk Nation thanks you, and we'll see you on the red carpet. It was a true pleasure, Vanessa. Thank you.